Coming up on Digital Music Trends 210 on the 26th of November 2014, Spotify's 2013 revenues, Beyonce Coldplay and Windowing Stories, the IFBI's report on investment in music, the Orchard and Sirius XM, the Billboard 200 Albums chart gets a streaming intensive makeover, and the Paul McCartney in virtual reality. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Leonelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available in a wide range of streaming services and if you are on iOS 8 please do go and check out your podcast app, you can subscribe uh, to the show uh, right from uh, your iPhone now, it's uh, embedded essentially in the iOS so there's never been a, an easier way really to subscribe to the show, otherwise you can go uh, anywhere uh, on the web, uh, you know any of the streaming services like Tune or a Stitcher or SoundCloud or a Mixcloud they will all have the show on there and you can also find it on Dogcatcher on uh, uh, the Android system and uh, um, you could also check out Overcast Overcast is quite a cool uh, new app that's come out for podcast consumption audio only and uh, uh, the show comes out regularly every week and this week it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, Cara O'Neill to the show a new guest uh, kind- kindly introduced uh, by Chandler Coyle so hi Cara and thanks for joining me how's it going? It's going great. We're going to have to give uh, Chandler all the credit on this connection, yeah? I know, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I promise I would. So, uh, so Cara, uh, t- tell us a little bit about what you do. Well, I'm an artist manager, um, and I basically learn to book tours on my own, um, trying to get you know my artist um, exposure. So, of course, it leads a little bit into booking agent slash artist manager. So, Absolutely. That's, that basically sums it up. And you studied with you studied with Berkeley as well, right? So, on, correct. Yeah. Yep. Great. Perfect. And uh, Stephen, uh, and, and and then of course uh, uh, for the for the video of yours, uh, you were allowed to have seen Stephen in the background. It's a real pleasure to welcome back Stephen O'Reilly, the Chief Marketing Officer at Shuff, Shuffler FM. So hi, Stephen. And thanks for joining me. How's it going? Hi, hey, Andrea. It's it's great. Good to be back. It's great to have you. And uh, uh, some uh, really awesome things happening at uh, Shuffler. And uh, I'm pretty sure uh, the majority of the audience of DMT will have already tried uh, Pause Magazine. But if they haven't, uh, they should go on the App Store and check out uh, Pause Magazine that comes out quarterly from Shuffler FM, which is the best uh, uh, stuff that's come out in that quarter curated by uh, your staff uh, and, and a bunch of other people, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we launched it at the beginning of 2014. And it's been... Uh been a great year actually we've been featured a ton of times by the folks over at itunes and um you know we're getting some healthy download numbers and lots of folks kind of like the idea of helping to curate the best of the best or just finding great stuff for people there's just so many websites so many stories so much stuff gets missed so we try and capture that every quarter and uh, present to our audience absolutely and uh, uh, once again it's a shuffer.fm and uh, does the spawns have a separate site or is it all um uh Reach yeah, we yeah we kind of really haven't promoted it too much, but it's right. you know because it's 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 pause.fm you'll find it, yeah, and uh, you know just by searching pause in the in the app store, great, and um, that's probably the best way. Nice, nice, cool. And so uh, this week we're going to start by talking about Spotify. I think uh, there were a few stories that were kind of n- none of them are massive, but they're all pretty interesting. So uh, Spotify has revealed its 2013 financial in a filing published in Luxembourg, of all places. So that's where we get all the juicy stuff uh, usually, or, or from, from 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 companies housed in the UK. Uh, and, and the picture that emerges is one of a company that is ex- experiencing rapid growth and uh, also facing a few challenges a- along the way. So uh, the company has uh, made around 750 million euros uh, in 2013 in terms of revenues uh, you know that it was calculated by billboard that that was uh, just over a billion dollars in uh, the exchange rate of the end of 2013 although now it's uh, slightly less than a billion if you, if you took, if take, in, take into account today's rate and uh, this represents a 73.6 increase from its 2012 earnings which is a, a massive increase obviously and uh, um, you know what some people have uh, cottoned on of course uh, uh, every single piece that I read about this had a different take uh, but uh, some uh, you know, caught on to the fact that uh, Spotify is still operating at a loss and that actually that, that loss increased uh, by uh, 16.4% to 93.1 million euros. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, the, the company's critics uh, will point uh, to, those, uh, to those numbers and say that Spotify is not able to actually make up, uh, uh, you know, the increase its, its revenues and also decrease its losses at the same time. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, you have to spend money to make money and Spotify is spending a, a whole lot of money on marketing, uh, about 182 million euros uh, between uh, marketing and uh, re- research and development of the company. And so, you know, there are some, some uh, things there that they can cut back on once they reach the scale that they want. Uh, so first of all, a quick round on, on that. 
but uh, uh, Stephen, what do you make of these? You know, does it tell us anything more about Spotify other than the fact that they are doing pretty well and that uh, uh, you know they can only grow further, really? Yeah, I, you know, I guess what they're, they're you know they're really going for it big, and um, you know, even the I was look, looking at those numbers and. I think I think they've increased their workforce. Or they expect to increase their workforce to two thousand people right. pretty soon. You know, so like that kind of stuff costs a lot of money. You know, they rolled out in thirty six, thirty two new countries in twenty thirteen. Um, again, costs a lot of money. You know, marketing and staff and you know all sorts of licensing and yeah. it, you know, so they're really aggressively going for it. And, th- and those figures that we've seen are from the calendar year of twenty thirteen. Right, and that uh, you know even like. Most recently, like they they put out some again some more interesting figures, you know, through Daniel X blog post uh, a couple about a week ago about you know the amount of money that they've paid back to the label since since you know two billion dollars. Yeah. Um. You know, losses have increased, but they've almost doubled their employees. Um. And you know, it's still you know whilst they are losing a lot of money, it's 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 a it's a serious amount of money. There, they're growing like in a really great way. Yeah. And. And they're still doing a lot of those deals that take a lot of time to develop with, you know, yeah. handset manufacturers and bundling Spotify in with Vodafone and your O2 and your T-Mobiles of the world. Those things take time. And, you know, I, you know I've heard it said before, and I'll say it again, that streaming still isn't mainstream, you know. Yeah. When my mum has it on her phone and then when, you know, um, you know other folks, you know, except the, the general, you know, like the general music fan, um that's when we're going to see, you know, exponential uh, numbers. You know, yeah. th- 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 I still think there's a massive amount of room to grow. And so do the guys at Spotify and their investors, you know, they've yeah, seemed sure. pretty patient <laughs> thus far. Yeah, and also they don't want to jump into an IPO. Having seen uh, the the sort of uh, uh, swing and roundabouts of, of IPOs of, of the last few months that haven't gone uh, the way that people qu- quite wanted and kind of backfired a little bit on, on companies. And uh, Kara, from your point of view, what do you think about uh, these uh, reports? Uh, does this uh, make you confident about the future of Spotify? Does it make you question a few things? So, w- w- what do you reckon? I mean, obviously they're here to stay and they have a huge following. Um, I'm not a Spotify user. It doesn't really apply to me. Um, but I know it's, it's just something that is, it's a huge thing. You know, it's like it's hot, uh, iTunes has its own radio. I wonder what their numbers are, you know? Um, but I mean, it's, it doesn't really make any difference to me. Is that yeah. sad? <laughs> I guess, like as a um, user, absolutely. A, like uh, I, I was, I meant like uh, you know, as an artist manager, do you feel like uh, your artists uh, can rely on this revenue going forward? Uh, uh, and, and you know, as you said, yeah, this company is here to stay, right? Yeah, it's a it's a nickel and diming thing that is happening with artists. I mean, really, they're all the plays that they're calculating and how much you know, point zero 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 six cents they're going to make from each play. It's just like beating a dead horse at this point and I've kind of it's like I just keep seeing it in the news and there's it's getting a lot of press because every bigger artist that keeps shining the spotlight on it I mean there's a weird thing going on there where you know biggest artists saying you know I'm pulling all my stuff from there and um, it's going to make a huge difference for artists that are virtually you know unknown on the come up Um, I come from a direct to fan background so ultimately um, I I have other strategies for that complaint, yeah. so to speak. <laughs> you're, yeah. not, you're not counting. You're not counting that much on recorded music revenues as as a right. <laughs> yeah, right. Right. And so, uh, and the other thing that was interesting. Uh, I mean, two two other things that I, I picked up on. The first one was the uh, purchase price of the Econest, which was uh, about fifty five million, which is a uh, million uh, euros, which is uh, less than what people thought it was going to be. Uh, people thought it was going to be around a hundred million dollars uh, US. And uh, the other thing that uh, I picked up on is the fact that uh, the advertising revenues were actually quite small. So the the interesting thing is that obviously you know 80% or uh, just just under 80% of uh, Spotify users are on the free tier uh, ad uh, ad support tier uh, but those users only brought in uh, a tenth of the revenues that uh, the subscribers brought in so uh, i guess here it kind of links up to the point that uh, Taylor Swift uh, and, and her record label were ma- uh, was making about uh, uh, free uh, Un- unlimited ad supported services and the fact that they weren't comfortable with that uh, pr- um, proposition which is why her music for example is still on audio but it's not on uh, Spotify or Deezer uh, so you know on that respect either the Econest or the this, the advertising thing uh, do you guys want to pick up uh, on, on one of the two and pick it apart uh, Stephen? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, well, you know, again, I, I kind of read carefully Daniel X's statement again, you know, um, and he was very clear that the, the free users drive paid users, you know, so yeah. like their biggest way to acquire uh, paid users is through the, you know, onboarding people from the free plan. So, um, you know, the numbers, are the, the, the percentage did seem a bit low to me, but they're still building that ad business. Yeah. And, you know, they're using the ad business to onboard those paid users. So it's a it's a good comeback to the folks over at Big Machine and Scott Borchetta and uh, those guys, you know, um, you know, because they prove, you know, they've given out the, the figures um, from Spotify that, that, that these free users are very important to becoming paid users. Yeah, absolutely. And the interesting thing here is as well that we're looking at uh, uh, figures, uh, you know, people have been banding around all these figures, but we don't really have, a, 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 you know, a real objective uh, numbers on what actually is going on there. And so I would love to know a little bit more about uh, uh, how Spotify is monetizing those uh, free users. And, uh, you know, of course, Pandora also, it took, took them ages to actually develop a, a proper advertising platform. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's only been in the last three years, four years, really, that they've started to make serious, serious money on, on, on uh, advertising and started to monetize mobile, for example, in, in the proper way. So, yeah, super interesting stuff on there. And uh, also, uh, also, sorry, just to kind of cut yeah, in on sure. that. The yeah. They've Spotify is still pretty small. If if you look at the actually, you know, the fifty million users, you know, yeah, eight. I think ten million of those are paid. You know, there's a massive amount to grow. You know, it, there's a massive amount of uh, oh, there's hundreds of millions of users out there to capture. Whether it will be Spotify that can go and capture them, or what Beats and Apple in the new year, who knows? Yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm, I I love Spotify. You know, I see in the statements for bands that I work with and and you know friends of mine that are in the business the, the you know the you know the Spotify are paying out a lot in the digital uh, end of things you know yeah. big money yeah uh, and Cara from a recommendation perspective so Spotify with the Aconest have, have made a, a pretty big bet on on uh, automated essentially playlisting you know at least a uh, uh, playlisting that is uh, pa uh, at least partially computer generated uh, through algorithms and analysis of the music so uh, wh where do you stand on that and, and do you feel like it, it was a good acquisition for, for Spotify I mean it, this whole playlist thing it's it's a great concept people really adapt to it really easily like the whole consumer aspect of that so um yeah it's it's like that's people want that that's why it exists and that's why it's thriving you know yeah. what i mean so it's they're just giving their consumers exactly what it is that they want and it's just making it easier yeah. just in any all of this radio stuff it's just uh, everybody's got options and that happens to be a really easy um, place for people. It's just, you know, getting an account through yeah. Facebook. Everyone has Facebook. It's just, it's just too convenient at this point. So, um, yeah, and also, yeah, without getting like fancy and technical about numbers and whatever it is, it just, it, it's, it's this thing that's so debatable but it's working yeah and it's kind of funny that people you know it, it, there's still like this big divide between companies that are doing constant focusing on human curation companies that are focusing on uh, algorithmic curation and companies that are sort of i mean most companies claim that they're doing both but there's clearly a, you know a slant towards one way or the other from from some of the services beats music for example is mostly a you know they, they really tout the human curation aspect of the service and that kind of uh, 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 feeds into some of the stuff that you guys are doing at uh, at shuffler steven H how do you feel about that that whole debate um yeah, we're very interested in it. And that's one of the reasons that we've done all the, 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 the stuff at Pause, you know. And I kind of feel, you know, my own personal, and I know Tim, who's the founder of, of Shuffler, like we talk a lot around everybody is mentioning curation and stuff. But for, for us, sometimes it's, 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 there's a lot of just talk, you know. Curation is just a, a list. And yeah. we're more interested in the stories, you know. So, like, what's behind, you know, so, so, that, so there's 20 songs, you know, that someone has curated, but why? You know, so like, what is the story of those 20 songs? Who was the producer? You know, what did Pitchfork or The Guardian or The Enemy or what do they say about this artist? And, you know, we, that's why we're all interested in the editorial aspect. And that's why Tim built Shuffler FM. That's why we don't pause because we wanted to be different to those guys that are focused on lists. And, uh, you know, lists for me, I find is another, I find them boring. Yeah. You know, I find uh, it's like looking at an Excel spreadsheet sometimes when you look at some of those services. Yeah. And, uh, the editorial and the stories and the background and the context and the validation from those professional writers that know what they're talking about, that's just so valuable. Yeah, and you don't really see a lot of that on, on, on a lot of the services. 
No, you're totally right, and I think you know every time I I, I decided not to go to South by next year, unfortunately. But uh, every oh. time I, I I go to South by, usually I I look at the list of bands that are playing almost like a chore because it's like a thousand plus yeah. and you're like oh god there's like this huge endless list of bands that i need to listen to now and so you kind of kind of sit there and start listening one by one in, uh, in a list and it's not uh, potentially it's, it's, not the, it's not the best experience yeah it's pretty it's pretty daunting and uh, uh Cara, from, from your point of view do you, would you like to see something you know especially as, as you're working with uh, diy artists uh, uh, do, would you like to see more uh of what Steven is talking about and, and perhaps a little bit more editorial on, on features and, and actually trying to expose your artists more than just having them inserted into, into a, a random list of tracks. Yeah, I'd like to see that actually work. You know, it's a, it's a slow crawl for DIY artists in general. So yeah. if they end up on one of these lists, um, it obviously brings attention to it. But if it's coming from somebody who people actually value their opinion, yeah. Yeah, sure. um, even, even better. So, and, and, I like to see artists playlist. Um, that's why I'm on SoundCloud because I like to watch what my artist is reposting or, you know, the, the artists that I follow or I go to their website and I, you know, office playlist, I see a whole list and I press the play button. Yeah. Um, that, that I want to be on to what it is that they're on to. Yeah. Um, and I'd like them to show me directly. So yeah, I'm totally, I think it's great. Yeah. I'm all for it. I can ask you actually. I haven't had a manager on since this thing happened. But uh, in mm -hmm. terms of the the, the Pandora uh, thing, the fact that they've opened up their analytics uh, uh, to artists, is it something that that uh, you feel is exciting to artists that that can now see where they are being played? And have you had any experience of this? Have you have you tried it out yet? I can't wait to get the analytics. Um, I've submitted an artist that I'm working with right now, and it's just a process, you know, waiting yeah. for them to get approved. But um, I think it's going to be so successful for them um, because I feel like a majority of their audience, you know, likely a nine to five, Monday through Friday type crowd um, who can probably get out on a Thursday, Friday, Saturday night. So that might tempt them to either, <laughs> you know, go out in whatever city that they're in, et cetera. So um, I like that. Pandora is like a super desk job radio, you know, streaming source for a lot of people. So yeah. I can't wait to see that. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and, and um, you know, talk, we continue talking about streaming, and uh, uh, I, I wanted to avoid the whole Taylor Swift thing, but I just wanted to mention it because a couple of things have happened. So first of all, uh, Taylor Swift has uh, reiterated her point that she's already made pretty clear uh, in various interviews uh, at the American Music Awards. Uh, uh, talking, you know, she said actually in a quote, uh, "By going out and investing in music and albums, you are saying you believe in the same thing that I believe in: that music is valuable and that music should be consumed as albums, and that albums should be consumed as art." and appreciated so that's her quote from the AMAs and uh, uh, you know it's hard to fault her on the statement and the sentiment you know of course uh, she she did sell uh, just over two million albums in, in uh, two, two and a half weeks or something in the US which is crazy uh, and even One Direction actually have uh, faltered uh, uh, and they've only sold about uh, 400,000 I think uh, uh, in the first week uh, of the new album uh, being on sale uh, and uh, and also we've seen uh, some other bands for example Beyonce has come out uh, and uh, put her album uh, finally on on streaming after a year pretty much of be being released 11 months uh, and Coldplay also have put uh, uh, their uh, uh, Ghost Stories album on streaming after a few months of it, it being released so uh, it kind of feels like we're heading towards uh, a windowing uh, and, and we're talking about this quite a lot on the show but a windowing, on, a windowing of music but the problem that I have with that is that it doesn't feel like it follows the way that the medium has traditionally been distributed of course you know the, the windowing for films has always been a pretty standard thing because you had to go to the cinema to watch the movie and so that was sort of the first barrier to, to consumption and then once that you know, ended, then it was going on sale or it was going on DVD or it was going on, on iTunes. And then after a little while, you could maybe uh, rent it on iTunes instead of buying it. And then uh, after a little while, it might end up on Netflix or on other streaming services. So uh, I, I would just wanted to ask you guys, do you feel like this uh, windowing is artificial when it comes to music? And does that impact the way that fans perceive it? Or is it still a natural progression of how album sales are going are gonna to carry on in the future? Steven? Yeah, you know, I feel a bit sorry for Spotify being the the, the whipping boys of this whole, uh, you know, debate, the, yeah. The, you know, yeah, the whole debate. You know, um, I guess they're the big guys now. But um, I, you know, I'm a fan of the whole uh, on iTunes, on Spotify, on audio, um, yeah. and 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 the vast majority of artists do that, you know. But there are the the big guys that you know the, the, the you know the Taylor Swift of this world and people like Jay Z, Jay Z, and and Beyonce who have their own stance, you know, and they just play hardball and they they do their own deals when they can. You know, Jay-Z did the big uh, yeah. 
they did the big Samsung deal, you know, I think they got five to ten million dollar advance from Samsung for a period of time for an exclusive. And those things are still gonna happen and always will. Yeah. But uh I think, you know, m- most reasonable managers and artists and labels and forward thinking folks I think they just, you know, they just want, and, and, and you know, m- m- bands as well. They just want people to, you know, get their, be able to access their music. And streaming is a is now a very legal way to get get at it early. And the download is dying. You know, yeah. uh, the the digital down. I haven't bought stuff from iTunes uh, music wise in a long time. Sadly, <laughs> I still buy vinyl records, but you know, I do, I could just I can get everything on Spotify. So I'm really happy to get it there and. While I'm on Spotify, you know, I you know, I can buy T-shirts and I can buy tickets to shows in the in the Spotify feed, you know, like I've you know I'm a Pixie fan, I'm a Led Zeppelin fan, and when I listen to their music on Spotify, my desktop, yeah, I get presented with information. You know, we know you're in London. Do you want to buy a ticket to a gig? Yes or no? You know, that is an amazing opportunity for anybody that's you know listening to music. You know, it's kind of like a a hot lead, and if you're in sales, yeah, um, and the same for merchandise. You know, I was I was listening to the to the remastered Led Zeppelin stuff the other day and and uh, I seen all the merch that they had available on, on you know on the Spotify client on my desktop and uh you know I, I you know I never I'd never looked at Led Zeppelin merch before online but I came across it through Spotify and um you know for a manager that you know like uh, Kara's in, in the DIY direct fan space and yeah. you know that is an amazing opportunity to be able to put offers and things in front of fans eyes when they're listening to your music you know yeah yeah sure and uh, Kara, for, for on the window inside uh, your perspective is interesting because i feel like it, it applies really well to massive artists but in a sense i've also heard of some smaller labels or, or, or independent artists that are like well for me those like 500 sales that i do when the album comes out a thousand sales are really vital to be able to make the whole project viable so i would rather not give it away for streaming for the first few weeks so that the people that are you know uh, we're going to buy it. Are actually going to buy it and then put it on streaming? Well, what do you feel? How do you feel about that? I mean, that's that's common practice, and what I would do. That's the pitch. It's yeah. you know, make it exclusive, do the scarcity thing, and I think that's exactly what Beyonce did and Taylor Swift is doing. I think um, her next move will go to streaming probably after a year span. Yeah. Um, in a DIY sense, it's like you know, sixty to ninety days. Um, give the fans the opportunity to buy directly from you, hear the yeah. music directly from the horse's mouth, um, come to our website, stream it, or whatever, however you're going to listen to your music, and uh, come out to the album release. Yeah. And then, you know, then we'll release it out to the rest of the world. But um, but just to keep that exclusivity and yeah. that that relationship that the fan has with the artist and feeling like, this is my thing, this is for me, yeah. the fan, and, you know, whatever, we're all cool now. But it- I think, like, you know, it's a huge thing for for Taylor Swift to come out and side with, you know, this pull the thing with like Tom York. I mean, that makes her cool, right? Um, because, <laughs> you know, so. Tom York is super edgy and, and you know, yeah. he calls the shots. And, um, and so it's like this affiliation with I'm not some pop girl with no brain. I can, I can pull myself. some power plays myself yeah yeah, yeah no, but, but i mean that that was good actually you know we, we don't we don't see that often enough but uh, um, uh, perhaps uh, not you know entirely uh corrupt you know the assumption that were made but uh, a, a very interesting stance there but uh yeah i mean it's it's interesting as i said you know it seems like it applies to the top end of the scale and to the uh, sort of the bottom end in the sense you know artists that are, do need to make those those few hundred or few thousand sales but uh, in, in the middle market it feels like all the artists are coming out with both the album and the stream at the same time so i wonder whether they are a little bit caught in the middle trying to figure out you know trying to reach them as many people as possible because they're already sort of middle-sized artists but you know kind of not really understanding whether they need to also pull the stuff on spotify or not for a, a few a couple of weeks or not so no it's, it's an interesting it's an interesting train of thoughts and i should stop uh, rambling on and uh, actually one one of the companies that i want to talk about was the orchard uh, sh- uh, quickly uh, the orchard has announced an, a really interesting deal uh, we talked about uh, a sound exchange uh, uh, for you know a long time on the show and i've also had uh, a couple of interviews done with the with the, the company you know it's uh, 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 and uh, the orchard essentially stated that they have de- decided to uh, bypass sound 
exchange uh, uh, altogether, which is a, a really interesting decision, essentially, uh, and made a deal, uh, well, not in general, but uh, in their uh, dealings with Sirius XM. So Sirius, Sirius XM, if you're in Europe, is a satellite uh, radio provider, and you can get it essentially anywhere that it is in the open air in the United States. Uh, so it's different from, from Pandora in the sense that you don't need an internet connection to be able to uh, listen to Sirius XM, and it's got uh, around 25 million subscribers in the in the States, which is a huge amount. And uh, uh, so th this deal essentially will permit uh, uh, the Orchard to get uh, stats uh, directly from Sirius XM. It will give them preferential playlists uh, on, on a bunch of their stations uh, and uh, essentially will allow them to have a much better overview. And the Orchard touts that uh, uh, Spotify, uh, that, uh, sorry, um, uh, sound exchange is not doing reporting correctly and so that is uh, sort of uh, the reason why they made the deal obviously the orchard is still not providing series exam with the pre-1972 tracks because they are not paying for them and so until they do the orchard is going to withhold them from uh, the uh, uh, the company uh, uh, Kara, i'll take your point of view i guess you're, you're in the states so you probably know more about these things but uh, you know do, do you feel like this is a start of a trend and we're going to see more companies that start making direct deals with the likes of series exam and bypassing sound exchange and if they do does that threaten sound exchange change altogether? I think so. Um, I know sound exchange is relatively new because obviously the digital stuff is quite new. So um, to be able to pinpoint the fact that they're not doing their job right, which is what they're supposed to be experts at, and people actually going straight to the source, I, that's a fantastic move, actually. I mean, um, you're cutting out the middleman, which is, you know, everyone's trying to do that yeah. <laughs> to make the most um, and wow, I thought it was really cool that, that they were able to make that happen. Yeah. And I, I can't wait to see who else follows, you know, uh, that, that whole pattern there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the interesting thing is that I, th I believe that Series XM actually operates on a compulsory license basis. And so I, I don't think that, uh, the Orchard would have gotten a better deal in terms of how much you get paid. It's just that they might get better data out of it and, and a better accounting uh, of, of that and perhaps even more money if, if as they maintained, Sound Exchange wasn't reporting on, on, on royalties properly. So, yeah, interesting deal. We'll see, we'll see if, if more happens around that, uh, uh, perhaps when we, when we look at Pandora as well uh, in, the, in the next few months. Uh, and uh, uh, let's look at the IFBI report, uh, Stephen. So uh, uh, I don't know if you managed to... Uh, I managed to literally skim read it. I didn't manage to read it uh, uh, completely yet, unfortunately. It's been a crazy week, uh, but essentially the IFBI released a report uh, uh, that details uh, how uh, uh, labels, how much labels are spending in um, uh, marketing and uh, A and R uh, for music, and uh, uh, you know they say that it's it's around uh, twenty seven percent of the industry's entire uh, entire uh, uh, revenues. It's four point three billion uh, annually in uh, A and R marketing, which is a crazy amount. It's it's a lot of money, uh, and uh, obviously the report goes on to um highlight the importance of record labels still, you know, talking about the fact that uh, uh, although people had given labels for dead uh, with the rise of digital, actually their role has become uh, even more important and they provide a bunch of services to artists that they uh, couldn't really get big without. And so uh, a lot of talk there about how to grow uh, artists' fan bases and how to uh, uh, spend money in, in a wise way to, to uh, increase uh, the appeal of the artist across uh, across um, uh, a larger uh, number of people. So, uh, Stephen, Stephen, uh, have you managed to read this report at all? Uh, and uh, uh, what do you make of the of the of the whole? It's kind of it's it's a bit of a propaganda piece in a sense. You know, let's let's not yeah. skirt around it. You know that they're, they're trying to you know talk up the the industry in in this in, in the way that they invest things, uh, invest in artists, uh, which is probably um, uh, right. But uh, how, what did you make of the report itself? Yeah, you know, I, I I didn't read the whole thing, but I did manage to kind of dig into it. And um, <laughs> before I got to the actual report, the guys at the CMU. You know, they had a kind of some hilarious observations about that report. Uh, so, yeah, Chris Cook at CMU, I, I recommend folks to go and have a read of it. You know, there's some choice language and, and phraseology in there, but it's quite funny and it's it's worth a read of it yourself. But um, I, I was also thinking that it's a kind of uh, report that you would associate with someone like FIFA, you know, who yeah. are kind of roll out these amazing reports <laughs> about themselves being wonderful and, you know, everything is okay and, you know, without us... The world would 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 not uh, function. Stop panicking um, as well. Yeah, stop panicking. <laughs> yeah, fine. you know, four point three billion dollars in invested in in A and R and marketing. I'm not sure. You know, with, you know what percentage of that amount. Is, is broken down between A and R and marketing. Know, yeah. I'd love to know. <laughs> uh, you know but, uh, yeah, I need to look look into it and see if there's actually a breakdown of the numbers. But uh, I, I didn't find yeah. it. I, and also, I, I read another uh, astounding figure. 
which was, I wrote it down here just, just so I was sure that, the, the, so the, this is one of the other uh, quotes was, the cost of breaking a new artist are between 500000 and $2 million. You know? Cameron, I'm so, sure uh, you will associate with that, Cameron, right? Have you got that much to invest in any of your artists' uh, <laughs> careers? I was like, how many artists, I mean, are you investing in? This is crazy. I, that, that article is so bizarre. But, um, but I thought, well, I mean, there could be some truth to some of these things, yeah. yeah. Uh, but this character, the way that he writes is quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's kind of, yeah, the, the figures were crazy, you know, 500 thousand plus and you know they talk about a major label and a major artist but uh, it, it just felt like there was too much emphasis on that major label and label artist figure <laughs> yeah it's uh, the, the, yeah very propaganda this piece uh, all that being said the, the 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 majors and the indies you know the majors still do a great job and yeah, fostering a lot of developing rock bands you know uh, and, and and you know in the you know kind of artists you know so i don't want to be hammering the the majors I've done a lot of business with those guys all my life and you know I wouldn't be in the in the business today without them and I do know they spend a lot of money on marketing yeah. but uh, yeah it's it's an astronomical amount of money yeah and um yeah I uh, it's a good report to to, to just to, to dig your teeth into there was a lot of obvious stuff in it as well yeah, there was another sure. quote, yeah, yeah there was another quote around um you know that nine of the top 15 I think it was tours uh, in the world this year where um on, on behalf of artists that had nine or ten albums released, you know, and that's kind of obvious, you know, like the biggest grossing tours are because yeah. they're the biggest artists of all time and they've been, you know, they've been around the block for 20, 30 years. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there's a lot of obvious stuff in there as well. But um, And by the way, did you know that Ed Sheeran is big enough in the UK to play Wembley Stadium twice? That shocked me today. Wow. <laughs> I, I think I was like, I tweeted, I blinked and missed it. Like, how, what happened? Like, that he went from <laughs> playing, like, you know, Shepherd's Bush and, or, you know, or the Apollo to playing Wembley Stadium. That's m mental. Well, he's a hardworking guy. Be you too know, fast. I know he, gets, he, he gets a lot of abuse. Uh, but, you know, what, what, a, what, a, what amazing business that that guy is, is turning, yeah. you know, he's turning around. Um, I mean, it's just a, a quick anecdote. We, um, we shared an office with SoundCloud for a couple of years uh, when I was with Mobile Roadie. And um, Ed Sheeran came into the office one day, played a few songs to like seven or eight people, you know, I three wasn't or there. four years what ago. Happened? Yeah, yeah, he was there. <laughs> I must and, have, uh, no, I must have missed it. <laughs> yeah, he was there. And, uh, you know, like he worked hard. And I've, I've seen him do, you know, after show part, when he was playing gigs in the Roundhouse yeah. in London, he would play outside afterwards for the fans that couldn't get in the door, you know, on the street. And, you know, he put in those 10,000 hours. And, uh, Absolutely, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And he plays solo. You know, he played to the O2 a couple of nights in a row on his own, just him and a guitar. You know, it's unbelievable. No, it's it's a great story. I mean, I, for me, it was I was shocked at the Justin Timberlake transformation when I heard the the first track of the new album. I was like, "What is this? Just, yeah, yeah. Is this just some Justin Timberlake? No, it's it's Ed Sheeran. Okay, fine, fine. It's it's cool. Uh, but yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's, it's, oh, sorry, it was just a side note because I, I was I was shocked that I saw the advertisement uh, advertisement for that on the on the London paper saying that the tickets were going on sale tonight, I think, or tomorrow night. Uh, one of the yeah. two. <laughs> Uh, Cara, do you think that artists are growing too fast now? It can kind of, you know, as Stephen was saying, most of the artists that can do pull off those massive tours are uh, artists that have quite a few albums under the belt. But now it seems like artists with barely an album out. I think, you know, I'm thinking of Ariana Grande, for example, that she's got only one album out, uh, and she's already yeah. playing massive, massive venues all over the US and 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 Europe. Yeah, that's like a to me. I think that's a little too risky for an artist just coming out. I think it's wise to really like the exclusivity part. I just keep going back to that because um, you, you really need to, I guess, nurture those first fans that come in and yeah, there might be like a thousand bajillion fans, right? Okay. <laughs> because it's, you're getting tons of radio play. They're going to yeah. exist. Um, and that just proves that radio play still is very much an important factor of a majority of these artists. Yeah. Um, so I pay attention to artists like Lord. I pay attention to um, the Ariana Grande. I want to see how they're touring. I watch those patterns. And when I see an artist play a venue that's way too big, like when I lived in Miami, it's like I, an artist that just came out and they're playing the Fillmore. Right. I don't know if we're ever going to hear from them again because <laughs> what's, what's the next level after that? How do you right. build that slowly? And they didn't bring Lord to Miami. Um, they could have easily put her in a perfect venue that's kind of like the Le Poison Rouge of New York in Miami. Um, 
and they didn't do that. I was so shocked. I was like, man, because she definitely has a fan base there. So I watch all that little stuff. And, um, you know, what Ariana Grande is going to go to Miami and play the American Airlines arena. You know, um, so that's just it's just a pattern. I'm, I'm fascinated by booking. So I pay a lot of attention to those types of things and uh, touring and all that stuff. So, yeah, it's uh, it's sometimes it's too soon and, yeah. it, and you're not. It's just like the, the fans are going to retire, just like you're seeing with the One Direction now. It's like, oh, where did all these fans go? It's like, well, okay. they peaked too soon, and that's it. The tipping point has already happened. Yeah, you know. I mean, One Direction. Yeah. I mean, uh, let's. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to uh, uh, give them for that. I mean, I'm sure they'll break up at some point in the next couple of years. But they still have a 46. <laughs> uh, I looked it up today. They have a 46 stadium uh, gigs planned for 2015, and I'm sure they'll, they'll want to make the money from those. So I don't think they'll break up until the tour is finished, at least. <laughs> yeah, a lot of money to be made there. <laughs> a lot of money to be made from all those stadium gigs. So it's it's, yeah. it's insane. And so, and, and I they think can... it's also. Um, sorry, just to, to jump in yeah, there. Sure, around, of course. Like, so. um, you know, if you're a responsible artist manager as well, would you throw your artist in there right at the deep end, you know, early? It's, you know, what if it goes wrong? You know, people can, you know, that can be very, very career ending as well, you know, mentally traumatizing. It's, it's <laughs> tough, you know, so like that's where the role of uh, great managers come in as well, you know, just to, to grow and develop your artists over time. Yeah, talking about great managers, yeah. actually, I, I, I should ask you guys to plug your own artists because you're both managers as well. So, <laughs> uh, Stephen, actually, your, your band has got an EP coming out next week, right? Yeah, that's right. I've been working for a couple of years with a band called Red House Glory, a rock band based here in London. And um, yeah, we've been plowing away, you know, for the past couple of years. And, you know, we could have released stuff ages ago, but it just didn't feel right. And we were working with different producers in different studios. But the guys took their time and, um, yeah, we, we released our first EP this week. Got some great coverage online with the blogs and stuff. Um, got a, you know, a show uh, next Monday in London at, in uh, Hoxton Bar, Bar and Kitchen. It's exciting for those guys, you know, it's their first proper studio release. And, um, you know, what I like about those guys is they're, they're in it for the long haul and, you know, they're not really too interested in, you know, being famous tomorrow yeah. and just developing and taking our time and doing it on our own. You know, we have, we've, it's, we've spent all the money ourselves. We've not chased labels, not being too desperate. Yeah. And, um, I, I, I guess it sounds like it's very similar to, to some of the stuff that Kara is doing with her bands. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, the website for that is, uh, uh, well, if, uh, I guess the best place would be facebook.com slash Red House Glory or on Twitter at Red House Glory. You'll find all the details on the release there. And I'm sure yeah, some, links, some links to music. And uh, Kara, from your side, what are the, uh, let, let's, let's pick a couple of artists that you're working with that you should like to plug. Um, let's see. Well, right now I'm very much exclusively working with a group of um, legacy musicians. Um, they've all been a part of other big you know international acts and they've kind of all come together to launch their own project so it's like they're starting from scratch as this new project called dark horse flyer um and they're really fantastic you know it's uh it's they're just like super skilled musicians who have yeah. tons of experience you're talking 40 years under their belt and um so yeah they're just you know they just released an album we're getting some good press now you know it's everything's falling into place and organically yeah. and uh that's what the focus is it's like you know we've got We've got a good momentum behind us. We have a lot of stuff out there, Guitar Aficionado and Relics Magazine. I mean, we've really <laughs> been placed in some really great places. Um, but I've worked with some really great artists in the past that hopefully when I grow my repertoire, um, yeah. I'll be able to take them under my wing again and make some stuff happen. But, you know, I've, in the past, I worked with a band um, that started out by the name Arbalis Libres. Yeah. They then changed their name to Eagle Chief. But, I mean, I was able to book them, like, over 100 dates in the United States, and they're a Spanish rock band. Wow. And <laughs> it's bilingual rock, but um, quite fascinating. It was a great band, and people were really into it, but in, like, a very crunchy, organic rock way. Um, and I, I still love the band a lot, and I, I think that they've got a really great future ahead of them. I'm curious to see where that goes. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, for Dark Dark Horse Flyer, it's darkhorseflyer dot com, and you find more details on the website there. Yep. And yep. Uh, and uh, talking about uh, artists and releases and all that, uh, let's make a very smooth headway, uh, heg, uh, segue. Ha Oh, I can't speak today. <laughs> I was going to say, segway, segway. let's make let's make a very smooth segue and talk about uh, the Billboard 100 chart. So, uh, the Billboard, uh, um, uh, sorry, the Billboard 200 chart. Uh, the Billboard 200 is being uh, getting a makeover actually from next week. I think I believe it's from the 5th of December that this is going to uh, uh, come into play, and essentially it's going to finalize.
suddenly start taking into account uh, uh, streaming numbers. So uh, the Billboard 100 chart, the Hot 100, uh, started taking into account streaming data in March 2012. It's a very long time ago. It's way before the UK uh, singles charts decided to, uh, to do it this year. And uh, now, over two years later, the Billboard 200 is doing the same thing. They will uh, essentially count 1,500 st song streams uh, from on-demand music services as an album sale. And so, uh, you know, that's a very interesting uh, choice there because uh, I'm, I haven't really read too much into it, but I'm wondering whether a one song being played 1,500 times could count for an album sale as well. Uh, and uh, 10 downloads of individual tracks as well from iTunes or uh, similar uh, music download stores will be considered as a track equivalent album and will be counted for uh, the chart as well. So, uh, interesting thing, if apparently, you know, this... Uh, could mean that some of the bands that uh, perhaps the album sales drop off uh, pretty pretty fast but still have a very solid uh, base of people that are streaming them they could linger in just in the album chart for longer than they're doing at the moment uh, and uh, it could also, uh, you know, undermine some uh, uh, artists that are more based on, on sales and less based on streaming. Of course, uh, 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 if they have a, an older fan base, for example, they might uh, uh, have sold more than a, a, another a younger act, uh, uh, but they uh, getting um, way less streams, and so that affects their chart positioning as well. So, uh, I, I don't know, Kara, uh, uh, how do you feel about this uh, change? Uh, uh, do you feel like the 1500 songs uh, for uh, album equivalent is fair and and how 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 will artists react to this? Um I think that that's going to give everybody incentive to be you know on streaming now. Everyone's right, going to yeah. shift over because then there's more headlines to be made. Um I mean I'm waiting for them to factor in the YouTube views as a part of this um, because I see Taylor Swift has 220 million. I mean, what, what number is that? It's crazy. Yeah. Um, but he here's your first prize, you know, first place award over and over again. I think that that's something that motivates these decisions to be put into action. Yeah. Um, the people speaking on behalf of these big artists that are getting tons of traction on YouTubes and streaming, et cetera. So um, I think 1,500 plays, does that break down to maybe the cost of an album sale? I mean, I'd have to do the math of all the point zero zeros yeah. and the six, right? right. Um, and that, you know, I mean, it's a total game changer. It's going to... It, like I said, it's going to bring more headlines. It's going to totally shake things up. Um, and I'm wondering about like the whole data thing. Like, are, is this something that they're just going to turn over? It's in, in, to give the artist, um, you know, th this information for yeah. you know, where their demand is and all that type of stuff. So um, it's crazy because the numbers are crazy. This is crazy to me. Um, but it's, <laughs> I'm waiting for the YouTube to factor in. That's yeah. the next thing. I mean, it's going to happen, right? Um, it has to. Because that's a huge... Thing. Yeah, I mean that's a huge thing, and I I wonder whether that will be like 1.5 million plays. <laughs> I mean, what about it's SoundCloud? Just... <laughs> oh, SoundCloud! No, SoundCloud is not going to be counted until they start paying some money, I guess. Unfortunately, right. uh, uh, and <laughs> yeah, that's that's just a state of fact. Uh, Stephen, for, for, uh, do you think this is going to happen in the UK as well? Of course, uh, as I mentioned, it took us two years here in the UK to catch up to the US uh, for the singles chart uh, in terms of streaming, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think it's going to be a, 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 a while before we can see the albums chart uh, integrate streaming. Yeah, it's probably going to be a while. I think it, I think all of those moves on the billboard side of things are very positive, and um, yeah, I'm I, I'm looking forward to seeing you know like seeing the, the the whole thing in action and seeing what it actually means. Um, yeah, looking forward to it. I, I was also um, thinking about like the importance of you know playlists. You know, some of these playlists that have huge amounts of subscribers. You right. Know, you get on some of those playlists and you're back in the charts. It's it's kind of that will be interesting to see how that will affect the charts as well. You know, if you can get on some of these playlists for a song that was out months ago, yeah, you're straight back in. Um, so yeah, play. I'm really interested in all those playlists yeah. as well. I, I don't really know how it's going to work. I, I'd, I'd love to know a little. I should have uh, looked into it before the show. But uh, if somebody is listening and can tell me more about it, I'd love to hear from you. Uh, uh, tweet me on at DJ Music Trends but I'd love to know for example if say that now it's, it's coming up to Christmas uh, uh, obviously like the likes of Mariah Carey and stuff like that is going gonna, gonna to get the usual song that, that uh, peaks uh, uh, somewhere in the charts uh, because it's being played all the time and uh, will that make her Christmas album for example pop into the charts uh, uh, in the US while it, it wouldn't have before so uh, yeah it's interesting question marks there and I look forward to seeing what's going what's gonna to come of it and uh, finally what, what else what else what else uh, is anything else happened 
recently I usually miss uh, one last story. Oh, that is this fun one to end on because I think it's kind of it's kind of hilarious. But uh, I, I was lucky enough to see a presentation of uh, Oculus Rift uh, at the Dublin Web Summit, or where they were talking about uh, where the company is going next, uh, talking about the fact that they really want to get the uh, VR virtual reality equipment headset right before they launch the Oculus uh, to the wider public. And it may be like probably uh, still. He said not. He said months, not just a few months, but many months. So maybe like, it was a very uh, kind of strange uh, quote that I remember from from the CEO. Uh, so it might mean towards the end of 2015, if not uh, early 2016, that uh, uh, the Oculus Rift is going to be released. But uh, if you don't want to wait for that, actually, you can try out the headsets that are based around the Google Cardboard project that Google uh, sort of unleashed uh, earlier this year. Uh, and uh, essentially, it's just a piece of cardboard that you can put your uh, Google uh, Nexus phone in, and it creates a, a a little a VR uh, uh, headset and you can create apps uh, for it that uh, sort of uh, uh, mimic the, the experience of VR. You can move your head and sort of see things around that way. And one of the people that has, has taken advantage of this is uh, Paul McCartney, uh, uh, which I uh, thought was an interesting story. So you can you can actually watch, uh, if, you d if you have a, a, an Android phone and you have this uh, uh, Google Cardboard thing, you can download a, a, an app made by Jaunt VR a developer, uh, and uh, it contains the footage of just one song, Live and Let Die, which was recorded at his uh, Candlestick uh, Park concert in San Francisco. Uh, it's just one song. It, it is completely free. So, of course, you know, you're know you not paying for it. You might as well get it if you have uh, both of those things that you need. And uh, the concert is filmed with a special camera, so you can literally look up and down. And it's a little bit like if any anybody in the, in the audience has played around with one of those uh, uh, panoramic apps where you can actually do a panorama of the, your entire surroundings and also look down and look up and it will create an entire picture. It's a bit like that, but you can also essentially experience the, the, the recording of of the song uh, from all angles and turn around and the sound will move with you apparently it's a 3D sound so uh, if you turn your back on him uh, you'll hear it differently than if you are uh, standing right in front of it uh, I don't know if this will catch on, but I, I love the idea of VR, and uh, uh, it kind of reminds me a little bit of Up, the, the Pixar movie where everybody's just uh, wandering around on balloons and, and watching things <laughs> on the screens. But Kara, <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you recommend uh, this to one of your artists, uh, or uh, you know, do, do you see this catching on? And could could it, you know, one of the big problems of the, of the music industry on, on the live streaming front is that it's really hard to draw people in into, into yeah. the live stream. And so, could this change things? I mean, it's kind of like the hologram, right? It's right. like you got Tupac showing up at music festivals and then, you know, everyone's freaking out. Um, this could be one of those things that just like is, becomes like all the rage. Uh, it would be awesome if they got some uh, younger generation. I think the, that Paul McCartney, I don't know how much of a young following he has, but I feel like it might be a really great <laughs> hit with the young, you know, Taylor Swift fans, One Direction fans, you know, th th that might be an experience that they like, but I'm not sure if my grandmother would be into this thing. <laughs> but she Maybe might, you know out. what I mean? <laughs> That's a very good <laughs> point, actually. Stephen, does it make sense for McCartney to have released this? I mean, how many of his fans are going to have the Google, ca Google Cardboard thing? <laughs> yeah, well, I, w I, was, I was thinking like... Um, you know, Scott Roger is, is McCartney's manager. I would have loved to be in the room when they were pitching that, when the guys from John were pitching it to the management and Mr. McCartney, you know, <laughs> Sir Paul. It would have been a crazy sight just to see Sir Paul with Google Cardboard on his, uh, <laughs> on his eyes. And, you know, it would have been hilarious. Yes. Uh, Count us in, listen, you know. They're trying to one-up you too, right? I mean, what is this? Yeah. It is <laughs> it's super niche, though, you know. And I, yeah. You know, I, you know I've seen, I, haven't, I haven't seen one of those Oculus Rifts in the wild. Um, or any of that VR stuff. Um, yeah, I think and we've had a number of one, false so. starts. We've had a number of false starts with like augmented reality, three yeah. D, all that immersive viewing kind of things. And um, maybe nobody cares. And <laughs> maybe maybe nobody if they do cares. care, <laughs> maybe if they do, it's still two to five years away from yeah. being from being like even relevant. Yeah. No, that's for sure. I mean, for now, it's even even when it does come out, and I, I, unfortunately, I wasn't, uh, uh, I didn't manage to try it out. I know there were uh, you had to book an appointment at the uh, in Dublin to actually uh, uh, get a run through of of the of Oculus and, and the latest version, which apparently is very very close to finished uh, in terms of uh, software and sort of experience. Uh, but uh, it's still a headset. It's not, you know, ideally, it's going to have to become sort of like a pair of non intrusive gl sunglasses of some sort. Uh, it's still like a pretty big piece of equipment and, and so of course for the next I think three or four years it's going to ha have to be limited to people that are really 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 into it and excited about it for gaming or for other things uh, but uh, uh, yeah I, I, don't, I wouldn't mind the idea of being able to sort of 
look at my computer, for example, or have my computer monitor while I'm commu commuting and actually doing some work instead of having to, uh, 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 you know, try and negotiate my Mac on, on, on a busy train and, and do some work on there. So, yeah, it's, it's interesting stuff. Uh, and that, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, guys, have you got any other story that you've seen around that you kicked around that you wanted to, to chat about? And if not, uh, please do feel free to, uh, uh, or any, any book or anything that you've read that you'd like to plug, really. Uh, and uh, uh, if not, feel free to restate your uh, respect sites so we, we can get people uh, heading there. Kara? Uh, you, um, you go for it. No, no. All right. All right. I'll go first. <laughs> um, I'm really a big fan of this noise trade uh, promotional offer that they have right. where you can blast out to 1.3 million of their listeners. And I've met, like I'm courting artists right now for management um, or they're courting me. I don't know, but <laughs> they've done this and they've had insane success with it. And it just, I can't, I mean, I think that's so amazing. I, I love this. I love it so much that I'm like, I, I want to talk about it. Um, because I think that most DIY artists are very like unaware that this exists. Yeah. So when I tell them, Hey, this opportunity, what have you checked it out? And it, I think that has potential to really help some um, some of these early adopters. It's like you have access to them. They want in on this. Um, yeah. Go for it. So tell us a little bit more because, of course, this uh, is one of those things that I read about but I haven't read too much, too deeply into it. And it's one of those things that sounds too good to be true. What, what, what does this in, entail? Basically, you know, you're featured in their email blast, which it's currently has, you know, 1.3 million subscribers. Um, it's, you know, it's kind of like a discovery type thing for these artists. Um, so there's a little bit of a fee for them that's involved, but they give away their album for free. And in return, they're getting thousands of emails. Um, in just one campaign, an artist can get, you know, three to, you know, 20,000 emails, something crazy. It's in wow. insane. And the artists that I've met are getting that many people on board downloading their stuff. So they have all this data now. Um, now they have a better idea of where they should go and tour. Um, and they're just seeing like all of it trickle in as a response to that. I think it's fantastic. I love meeting artists now that are like, it's working for me. Nice. Great. That's the best thing, right? Yeah. 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 That's good. Excellent. Thank you for the tip. And uh, uh, again, noise trade and go and check it out. And uh, uh, and uh, Kara, for your own website, or what, what is it? Where should people go and check, you out, check out your stuff? Um, I'm okira.com, O-H-K-E-R-A.com. And that's just my personal website. Um, sure. I, I kind of just keep my opinions light over there, but I do place them every so often. It's all in my head otherwise. <laughs> um, <laughs> Perfect. And Twitter's where I get really brutal. So don't be offended. <laughs> and, and Stephen, for you, it's uh, uh, it's uh, shuffler.fm, of course, and also uh, you can uh, go on soundcloud.com slash redhouseglory to find out more about the band. And anything else you wanted to talk about? Um, yeah, well, I guess like um, it's been gone, it's been around a, a good while now. But Steve Rennie, uh, Renman Music and Business for any aspiring m managers, you know, he has some of the best, you know, music industry podcast kind of focus for you managers absolutely and uh you know uh, you know i got have i broke off no no you're sorry here. i thought i thought i could no, no, you're here, you're apologies here. yeah but i you know i'm a big fan of steve Ren steve rennie and renman music and business uh he's been a good good guy for me to know he's been very helpful and uh it's a great website some great videos and lots of stuff to learn and it's free Absolutely, and uh, yeah. and Steve has been on the show a couple of times, and he's a fantastic yeah. guy to talk to. Uh, and uh, he's, super. he's personally responsible for my career as well. He's been a oh, huge awesome. Awesome. person behind me. Yeah. Love it. Nice. That's fantastic. So yeah, yeah uh, all 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 in favor of Steve for sure. <laughs> yeah. And you can check out the YouTube Hail channel Steve. as well. If you go if you go on, on DMT's YouTube channel, uh, you'll also find a link to uh, Ranman and B on there as well. It's one of the the ones I featured on there. So uh, uh, do go and check out his site. It's, it's fantastic. Some great interviews there. And uh, I think that's all for this week. Uh, it's been a, a fantastic show. Thank you so much for joining me, Kara uh, 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 and Stephen. Uh, always a pleasure to uh, to see you. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, DMT is going be back next week uh, with uh, more news uh, you can find out uh, uh, everything that you need to know on digitalmusictrends.com if you would like to uh, receive a newsletter uh, that tells you when the show actually comes out you can go on bit.ly slash dmt list and uh, you receive a weekly email as soon as the shows are uploaded uh, thanks so much for listening have a fantastic week and uh, till next time